It has been said that scientific progress is accompanied not by cries of Eureka, but instead by murmurs of, huh, that's weird. Well, we've just observed a faint point of light on the sky whose weirdness could change the way we think about the universe on the larger scales. This particular, huh, that's weird, takes the form of a white dwarf star that's doing some stuff that no white dwarf should ever be able to do. In fact, it has multiple properties that are so extreme that it almost certainly did not form in the way we thought that all white dwarfs formed. This one particular point of faint life may change our understanding not just of white dwarfs, but of all of cosmology. Mysterious, huh? This particular mystery began at the Zwicky Transient Facility in California, a telescope dedicated to watching for things that go bump in the night astrophysical objects that vary over time. Astronomers using the ZTF caught a white dwarf that at first glance looked suspicious. A bit too massive and spinning a bit too fast. That spin was seen in its rapid but periodic flickering. It got the poetic name ZTF J1901 plus 1458, but we'll call it Z for short. Now, in a criminal investigation, a suspect must be treated as innocent until proven guilty. In a scientific investigation, we should assume a thing to be typical until proven weird. Well, follow-up observation proved Z weird beyond reasonable doubt. Observations with the Hale telescope confirmed that it's one, definitely a white dwarf, and two, definitely spinning way too fast to make sense. Before we get to why this is so weird, let's review what we know about white dwarfs, or at least what we thought we knew. When all but the most massive stars end their lives, they blast off their outer layers in their final fits of nuclear fusion. This exposes their naked cores, which by now are insanely hot nuggets of nuclear ash, hyperdense balls of mostly carbon and oxygen. These are white dwarfs, the final fate of any star less than eight or so times the mass of the sun. Now, that's how we thought that all white dwarfs were formed, but something is off with Z, particularly how fast it's spinning. Now, we do expect white dwarfs to rotate, after all, stars rotate and so should their remnant cores. That spin should also increase as the core slowly collapses under its own gravitational crush due to the conservation of angular momentum. But typical white dwarfs take from a few hours to a few days to rotate. But it's hard to see how any star could be rotating fast enough to produce a white dwarf that spins once every seven minutes. Such a parent star should have torn itself to pieces. And so the mystery deepens. At this point, astronomers decided that the object was weird enough to bring some serious firepower to the investigation. The W.M. Keck Telescope in Hawaii, one of the largest telescopes in the world. Keck was needed to do the spectroscopy, to break the white dwarf's light up into component colors. Splitting the light this way makes it even harder to detect this already faint object, hence the need for a giant telescope. But it's worth it, because spectroscopy can yield an enormous amount of information. It's a full forensic workup. For example, it gives us spectral lines. When electrons in an atom move between orbitals, they emit or absorb light with very specific wavelengths. That gives us what kind of atoms are in the object, but also a lot more. In the case of Z, the wavelengths of the hydrogen absorption lines were shuffled all over the place, in a way that suggests the presence of gigantic magnetic fields. Fields around a billion times stronger than the Earth's or the Sun's magnetic field. And that's at the top tier of the most magnetic white dwarfs. Okay, so far so weird. The next step in the Star Sleuths playbook is to get an accurate measure of size. Size is hard to measure even for normal stars. Most are so far away that even our highest resolution telescope cameras see them as single points of light but astronomers have a clever trick. If you know how much light a star is churning out, its luminosity, then you can figure out how big it needs to be in order to shine that brightly. You also need to know how efficiently it's shining, how much energy for every unit of surface area. But that's just a function of its temperature, and you can measure temperature from the star's color. Temperature is surprisingly easy to measure, but luminosity is less so. Luminosity determines how bright a star appears to us, but there's another factor at play here, how far away the star is. Measure a star's brightness on the sky, factor in how much that brightness has been dimmed by distance, and you have luminosity. Then luminosity plus temperature, 
gives the star's size. So the only thing we're missing from the equation for size is the distance to this star. And of all these things, distance is the hardest to measure. The most accurate way to get distance to stars is with stellar parallax. That's when the motion of the Earth causes the star to move relative to more distant stars. Until recently, it's only been possible to do this for the most nearby stars, but the European Space Agency's Gaia satellite changed that by measuring parallaxes for a billion stars across the Milky Way. And Z was one of them. So we have its distance, around 135 light years away. Combined with our measurements for temperature and brightness, we get a radius for Z of 2140 kilometers, plus or minus a few hundred. And that is tiny, even by white dwarf standards. For comparison, a white dwarf with the mass of our sun would be around the size of the Earth. This new guy is barely 25% bigger than the moon, making it the smallest known white dwarf. Now, one reason that it's good to know the size of a white dwarf is that it also tells you its mass. Here we need to learn something that's weird about all white dwarfs, not just Z. We normally think about objects getting bigger the more massive they are. That's true of planets and regular stars, but it's not true of white dwarfs. In white dwarfs, matter is crushed so close together that the inward gravitational pull is insane. The only thing holding the star up from absolute collapse is the fact that if it got any smaller, its electrons would start to overlap. They'd have to occupy the same energy states. But that's forbidden by quantum mechanics, specifically by the Pauli exclusion principle, which tells us that particles in the fermion family, like electrons, can never occupy the same quantum state. In atoms, electrons are held in place by the Coulomb force, electrostatic attraction to the nucleus. And those electrons can occupy discrete energy levels, where the higher the energy, the closer the electron is to escaping the atom. Electrons are bound to the white dwarf by gravity, but they still have discrete energy levels. A forming white dwarf will collapse until the electrons are driven down to fill all of the lowest energy states. At that point, it can't collapse any further because there's nowhere for the electrons to go. What happens if you add more mass to a white dwarf? Well, first let's think about what happens when you add mass to less weird space stuff, say a planet or a star. The matter inside is crushed closer together until there's enough pressure to resist the extra gravity. So the original matter contains a smaller volume, but that doesn't entirely compensate for the fact that extra matter is added to the surface. The result is that adding matter usually causes an object to increase in size. But for white dwarfs, it's different. As you add mass, the white dwarf has to actually shrink in size in order to have enough pressure to resist the extra gravity. As a result, the more mass of the white dwarf, the smaller in size. So, if Z is the smallest known white dwarf, it must also be the most massive. Doing a little quantum mechanics, it was found that it must weigh in at 1.32 times the sun's mass. And that's a lot, at least for a white dwarf. We've known for some time that the absolute maximum mass for a white dwarf is 1.44 solar masses, the Chandrasekhar limit. Above that, and the matter gets packed so close together that one of two things happens. If a dying star's core exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, then it collapses into a neutron star or a black hole. But if you already have a white dwarf and then slowly add more mass, it'll explode as a type 1a supernova. Z is below this mass limit, so it has avoided destruction so far. But we'll come back to its final, possibly cataclysmic fate very soon. Okay, let's review the evidence. We have one weird white dwarf. It's extremely massive and compact, but that's not so strange in itself. The strange part is that it's rotating extremely quickly and has a crazy strong magnetic field. We just don't see these extreme properties in the white dwarfs produced as stars die. But there is another mechanism that could have done this. One that we know must happen out there in the universe, but we've never seen conclusive evidence for it. Z could be the result of a white dwarf collision. If two white dwarfs are orbiting each other, we expect them to slowly spiral together as they emit gravitational radiation that saps away their orbital energy. Now, we've seen the result of this with black holes and neutron stars when LIGO detected the gravitational waves from the last moment of those in spirals, but it should happen with white dwarfs too. If a pair of white dwarfs merge, two things might happen. Either their mass adds up 
to more than the Chandra Sekhar limit and bad things happen that I'll come back to, or it adds up to less and we get a bigger, much weirder white dwarf. That star would be spinning really, really fast because it doesn't just have the angular momentum from its spinning parent stars, it has the angular momentum from the orbits of the parent stars. This process also explains the intense magnetic fields. Magnetic fields in stars and planets are generated by dynamos, self-sustaining currents of charged particles. A collision like this could well produce the sort of turbulent motion to jumpstart a dynamo powerful enough to produce the observed magnetic field. Okay, so we have a possible origin story for this white dwarf. Remember I said that we should assume typical until proven weird? Well, that still applies. If this one white dwarf formed this way, that means others probably did also. And it means that white dwarf mergers really do happen, which actually has really broad reaching implications. Now, remember that I said that two things can happen when a stellar remnant exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit of 1.44 solar masses. Either absolute collapse for massive stellar cores or absolute explosion for accreting white dwarfs. So what happens to merging white dwarfs that exceed the limit? Well, we actually don't know. It could go either way. But if merging white dwarfs do explode, then it may well be that many of the type 1 supernovae that we see are not from accreting white dwarfs as originally believed. If that's true, then it may actually affect our understanding of the universe on its largest scales. That's because observations of type 1a supernovae were how we first discovered the existence of dark energy. And we've talked about how that was done previously. If it turns out that a significant number of those supernovae come from merging white dwarfs rather than accreting white dwarfs, then perhaps our calculations of the amount of dark energy are wrong. And in case you haven't been paying attention, there does seem to be a disagreement between the supernova dark energy measurements and the measurements from the cosmic microwave background. Again, covered previously. Don't get me wrong, the issue with the supernovae would not make dark energy go away, there's just too much independent evidence. But this is probably something that we should try to sort out anyway. Okay, let's get back to Z. We know how it might have got here, but one mystery remains. What is its fate? Will it just cool and fade to a black dwarf over trillions of years? That's the usual doom of a white dwarf. But Z may get its explosive finale after all. A typical white dwarf is pretty dense at around a metric ton per cubic centimeter. Z is a thousand times denser still. That means it can support incredibly energetic electrons in its core. Electrons so energetic that they are in danger of slamming into protons, which would turn those protons into neutrons. And if that starts to happen, then you get a chain reaction of so-called electron capture, which is how you turn a white dwarf into a neutron star. Z seems to be safe from that happening but only barely, and that may change. Over millions of years, heavy isotopes, nuclei with more neutrons than protons, will slowly sink or sediment to the core. These nuclei are more susceptible to electron capture. So build up enough of that stuff in the center and the electron capture chain reaction may begin, giving us another path to supernova and a bad end for our highly suspicious little star. So there we have it. ZTFJ1901 plus 1458, Z, is a moon-sized, highly magnetized white dwarf probably formed when two low-mass white dwarfs spiraled into each other. It teeters on the edge of explosion and may force us to rethink how we measure our universe on the largest scales. It's a glimmer of weirdness that tells us that the universe isn't quite what we thought it was, perhaps a powerful clue towards a better understanding of this generally weird space time. Our Patreon supporters make it possible to keep up the standards of this show. Without your support and enthusiasm, by now we'd probably have sunk to space themed reaction videos and quantum mechanics based pranks. Actually, that last one might be kind of funny. Anyway, as always, thanks for everything. And today's extra special thank you goes to Charlie, who's supporting us at the Big Bang level. Charlie, the fabric of space around us thrums with the infinitesimal vibrations of countless white dwarfs that have merged since the beginning of time. With the help of your support, we've deciphered their song, Come To Us From A Universe Away. It turns out that they sing your praises, Charlie, and extend their white dwarf blessings. 
May your magnetic fields stay untangled, your electrons be ever degenerate, and your mass remain always sub Chandrasekha. Okay, last time we took a magnetic tour of the universe, exploring how magnetism shapes our cosmos from the scale of planets up to entire galaxies. That magnetic episode attracted many questions. Peter Tuller asks whether the force that stops him when he runs into a wall is ultimately electromagnetic. Well, actually, it's not only that. Electromagnetism is responsible for the strong bonds between atoms in a solid, so the fact that the wall doesn't fall apart is due to electromagnetism. But the reason you can't just pass through the wall is something else. It's the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that electrons in atoms can't be shoved into each other to occupy the same energy levels. Now, we'll actually be coming back to that when we get into the spin statistics theorem. De Cronu asks whether magnetic fields have any measurable effect on the orbits of stars around the galaxy. Well, not directly. The galactic magnetic field is very weak compared to the magnetic fields of stars or even planets. Stars don't respond to that field directly. However, gas does respond to the galactic magnetic field. It can definitely move gas around and even trigger gas to collapse into stars. So the locations that stars formed may be influenced by magnetic fields which in turn affects their orbits. So the answer is yes, sort of. Alexander Charlton and Brandon Munshaw and some others ask where the magnetic field lines are really lines versus some sort of continuous thing. Well, it's definitely the latter. The field lines are just the way we represent the underlying continuous field. Like Brandon's example of isotherms on a weather map or elevation contours. Field lines are continuous and the exact choice of where to draw them is somewhat arbitrary. But unlike isotherms and elevation contours, they don't represent lines of constant field, rather they represent the lines of steepest gradient in that field. The lines of constant field would be drawn to intersect the field lines at 90 degrees. A number of you ask questions about the potential role of magnetic fields in the universe that all have the same answer. For example, can magnetic fields be used to explain dark matter? Or to explain dark energy? Or could magnetic fields be used to power spacecraft? So the answer is no. Although magnetic fields do have important effects on the scales from stars to galaxies, they're still much, much weaker than gravity. Some people also hopped on to imply that with this episode, I'd validated the electric universe idea, which states that electromagnetism drives the universe on the larger scales and that gravity is either negligible or doesn't exist. So let me be clear, the electric universe pseudo theory is about as valid as flat earthism. It's just dressed up a bit nicer. But I don't want to get all negative at the end of the video, so instead I'll direct you to Professor Dave Explains' YouTube channel for a satisfyingly scathing debunking, along with a brutal analysis of the psychology of pseudoscience conspiracy theories. I will just say this. If electromagnetism really does govern everything, why wasn't Magneto the most powerful of all mutants? He should have been able to control all gravity, not just metal stuff. Personally, that's enough evidence for me, but if you need more, check out Professor Dave's episode, linked below.